So this is the, the third session of our now annual Rice UBC QMI meeting. Uh, and we'll start off today with Silke Bueller Passion, who's going to be talking about electronic localization, delocalization transitions in heavy fermion compounds. Okay, thank you so much. Let me share. You see it? Okay, so thank you very much for having me as a guest uh, in your uh, beautiful meeting. Um, so this session is actually called uh, Strange Metals Near Localization. So I, uh, I tried to fit to that uh, by calling my talk Electronic Localization Delocalization Transitions. And I will focus on the case of heavy, heavy fermion compounds, but show that that's not unique to heavy fermion compounds and their relation to strange metal behavior. So it's about does strange metal behavior um, that occurs in many different material classes uh, have anything to do with electronic localization, delocalization transitions? And of course, uh, my perspective is that yes, otherwise uh, this title wouldn't make any sense. Okay, so um, let's start by looking at uh, what strange metal behavior is and what do you see here? is different uh, temperature tuning parameter phase diagrams where the color code represents the exponent of the electrical resistivity. And uh, the uh, color that sort of comes to your, uh, springs to your eyes, like the orange or the yellow or the reddish here is an exponent that is equal to one, meaning that this law here holds in these uh, sort of tornado shaped uh, regions of these phase diagrams in all these different materials. And these are heavy fermion compounds, um, transition metal oxides, cuprates, uh, more heavy fermion compounds, nictides, magic angle twisted bilayer graphene, where you also have these extended ranges. So, so that's something that occurs in many different material classes. And thus is interesting because it's, uh, it's not a single case, but it's a, yeah, it's a theme in, in strongly correlated matter. So we have all interest to understand it. Um, so we have all interest to understand it in its own right, because it's a phenomenon that is broad and that is uh, not intuitive, because what we would usually expect in a metal is behavior that goes like a Fermi liquid, so that we have a T-square resistivity and not a linear in temperature resistivity. So that's a fundamental interest in this state, but there's also a second aspect that I would like to also address is that these uh, strange metal states um, frequently or sometimes uh, condense or, 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 or drive um, new phases. And that's seen, for instance, in this example here, um, where um, a dome of superconductivity is centered around the place where the strange metal behavior extends to lowest temperature. And that's also seen in uh, many of the others, except for maybe if magnetic field is the tuning parameter, because magnetic field tends to kill superconductivity, and then it's less obvious. But there's not only superconductivity, there are also other emergent phases, and I will address that in the very end of the talk. Okay, let's start with uh, the, the strange metal state as such. And I will focus on this material here, because that's the material we started in, studied in detail and also because it is uh, particularly simple, uh, shows this behavior in a very beautiful and simple way. So this is the crystal structure. This is this uh, orange uh, tornado, and uh, I put the meaning of it here again. It's the exponent of the electrical resistivity uh, of the temperature dependence of the electrical resistivity. Um, okay, so, so what, what are the colors? So the color of Blue here represents exponent two. That's Fermi liquid law. That's uh, what is the standard theory of metals. And uh, from this Fermi liquid behavior, we can um, measure by uh, determining this prefactor here. Uh, the um, well, it's 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 proportional to the effective mass of the quasi particles. So we see by measuring this prefactor how strongly correlated our material is or how, how, how big the band renormalization or the quasi-particle renormalization is. And you can see this A coefficient here measured at low temperatures um, as function of the tuning parameter, which is the magnetic field. And what you see is that this A coefficient increases steeply towards 
um, the point where, in fact, the tornado is anchored at zero temperature. Um, and this uh, behavior or this increase is just replotted in this uh, phase diagram here so that you see that even though everything is blue here at low temperatures, so it's a Fermi liquid, but the Fermi liquid is already um, highly unusual in the way that effective mass masses get very strongly renormalized towards this uh, special point here. Um, so um, these Fermi liquid parameters have been determined in many different heavy fermion compounds, and you see a large list of these materials here. And um, then what has been realized is that the prefactor of the electrical resistivity contains the same information as other Fermi liquid parameters, uh, notably here, the Sommerfeld coefficient, which you can extract from specific heat measurements. And that just means that all these Fermi liquid parameters contain the same information, and that information is information about um, the effective mass, or um, in more general terms, the um, correlation renormalization. OK, so that's the Fermi liquid. Now let's look at um, the exponent equal 1. The exponent equal 1 um, is what we call the strange metal, or what is typically called the strange metal. So a metal that has a linear and temperature resistivity is called strange metal. So what is it due to? Um, here in the phase diagram, before I uh, put the line, it wasn't obvious. It seems like it comes out of nothing, but that's not quite true. It does come um, out of the point where um, phase transition is just continuously suppressed. So there is nail, a nail transition in this material, low temperature, very low temperature, antiferromagnetic ordering. And indeed, where this tornado is anchored, this phase transition disappears. So of course, you might say, well, that's, that's the reason for this uh, strange metal behavior. But in fact, it's not, it's not the case. So let me explain this. Um, if an order parameter vanishes continuously, there is a theory that can describe this behavior. So uh, of course, there will be critical fluctuations. And these critical fluctuations will have impact. But can they lead to linear and temperature resistivity? And that question has been, in fact, addressed very early on um, by investigating quantum critical points in the so-called Ginsburg-Landau-Wilson paradigm, which uh, attributes all changes of the properties to the vanishing order parameter. And it was pointed out in this paper here that if you have antiferromagnetic order, well, you will have at the ordering wave vectors so-called hotspots or hot lines on your Fermi surface. And around these regions, the scattering can be very special. But away from these regions, the scattering will be totally normal. And this normal scattering will short circuit the unusual scattering. And thus, the electrical resistivity, in fact, is expected to be just t square. Then nothing special will happen to the resistivity. And uh, then uh, this order was added to these calculations by Achim Roche. And he found that, yes, that can uh, change the power law to some extent. So you can go get, get power laws that are different from t square. But in fact, you will never have a wide range of linear and temperature resistivity, in particular, not down to the lowest temperatures. But that's what is observed. So this ginsburg landau wilson description of quantum critical points cannot lead to linear and temperature resistivity over very extended regions down to the lowest temperatures. So what else is it then? And that was already uh, addressed long time ago. Um, one um, proposal that was made um, motivated by inelastic neutron scattering experiments is uh, that there could be something which is called a condo destruction quantum critical point. And I will explain that further on. And that is directly related to this localization delocalization transition. So what was observed in this neutron scattering data is a certain scaling uh, so-called energy over temperature scaling with a fractional exponent that cannot be obtained in this uh, Ginsburg-Landau-Wilson paradigm. So that it pointed to something else. And the proposal, as said, is that local quantum criticality, as described in this publication here, um, is uh, the origin of it. And in fact, within this uh, theoretical model, um, this type of scaling was indeed obtained. 
So um, I show you another experiment that showed that something unusual is going on here, and it's the evolution of the Hall effect. So the Hall effect is just a normal Hall effect measured with transverse uh, contacts on, uh, on a sample, um, shows a rapid crossover um, at the position where we have this quantum critical point. So we measure isotherms uh, across the space diagram, which has the orange tornado here, um, and we see a rapid crossover. And this crossover sharpens as you go to lower temperatures. So, so how is all that related to, uh, how, how does all that work together? Let's first uh, look at the orange tornado. So that's indeed where this crossover happens. And the picture um, that, um, uh, the way how to understand it is the following. So this condo destruction means the following. Um, condo lattice is just depicted here. So you have on each lattice side, you have a local magnetic moment in condo systems, and you have in addition conduction electrons. And if the condo effect is not um, leading to the condo ground state, then, well, you have the conduction electrons giving rise to a Fermi surface, but the local moments uh, don't participate in it. But in the condo coherent ground state, the conduction electrons screen, screen the local moments and then participate in the Fermi surface and the Fermi surface is large. So that transition in the Hall effect um, from a small to a large Fermi surface is what supports this condo destruction description that also gives the right power for the inelastic neutron scattering data. So that was already uh, quite some evidence but of course, one is never satisfied and uh, wants to go beyond. And um, before showing you evidence beyond this uh, jump in the Hall effect, I show that it is not something unique to this material and not even to the material class of heavy fermion compounds, but it is uh, observed also in other situations. So here I show um, another heavy fermion compound where also this jump in the Hall effect occurs. So jump I refer to in the extrapolated zero temperature limit at finite temperatures. Of course, it's a crossover. In the cuprates, it is heavily debated, but this is the figure that uh, supports that claim that there is also this jump in the Fermi surface. And some tentative evidence uh, is also found in magic angle twisted by layer graphene uh, near certain fillings. and um, there are other materials that uh, have indications for this physics as well. But now let's go uh, beyond sort of the low DC transport. Um, I will show you results of so-called optical conductivity, but not in the optical frequency range, but in the terahertz frequency range, um, where that, that is relevant to these low energy scales in these systems. Um, in particular, what is needed to get information about the low energy behavior is uh, the, the detailed frequency and temperature dependence of the systems at very low temperatures and very low frequencies. And to, to have precise information, the technique of choice is time domain transmission spectroscopy, because that uh, gives you both the complex uh, real and imaginary part of the optical conductivity without resorting to Kramer's chronic tr transformation that uh, introduces um, sizable errors in particular at very low frequencies. So in order to apply this technique, um, thin films are needed and uh, they were in, in, indeed developed over a long span of time uh, in this molecular beam epitaxy system that we set up. And you see um, the germanium substrate here, transmission electron microscopy image and the MBE grown thin film on top of it um, that uh, was used for these experiments. They were done at Rice University by um, Jean Kono and uh, the, his, at that time, student, Xing Wai Li. So I show you the results here. This is the raw data, but they are shifted, uh, offset for better visibility. And then similar to the inelastic neutron scattering experiment, one tests uh, scaling relationships. And here the scaling, relationship that needs to be tested for dynamical energy over temperature scaling is shown in this form. And what we see is, so what is done in this, uh, what one tries to collapse all the data by optimizing or minimizing uh, this, this exponent alpha. And what is seen is that the best collapse is obtained if the exponent alpha is very close to one. 
So, so what does that mean? Well, um, one tries to look at the dependence of the dependence in frequency and temperature at the same time here. Um, but of course, there are limits where one will recover the linear and temperature resistivity. So that's the limit um, where the frequency is much smaller or omega h bar omega is much smaller than kVt. So that will is, is, is equivalent to linear and temperature resistivity in that uh, limit. Um, but there's also another interesting limit, the limit where temperature is much smaller than h bar omega, so then the energy equivalent of the frequency. And in that regime, indeed, one has a so-called optical resistivity, which is linear in frequency. So, so this relationship means nothing else than all combinations of energy, uh, of frequency and temperature contain that linearity in themselves. So, but it's directly seen in the in these two uh, limits. But this kind of scaling uh, exists for all uh, regimes of energy and temperature. So that that means in some way that uh, this linear, the strange metal resistivity is not just a static uh, quantity, but it's dynamic. So it means that what is happening there, and we know there is the jump in the Hall effect, uh, that that this carrier localization, delocalization transition that occurs there, which is the localization of our local moments, right? They become delocalized when they are condo screen because they participate in conduction, means they are part of the Fermi surface. So the local moments delocalize, that that is a dynamic process. So it's a fluctuating process of being localized and delocalized essentially at the same time at the quantum critical point. Interestingly, um, that type of scaling is also seen in the high TC coup rates, and that has been seen early on. Um, it has not really had huge impact, though it is a state of the art work, because the scaling was not really convincingly seen in a very large um, range of uh, h bar omega over kVt, but only in sort of a narrow range, and then it went, uh, the curves went off. Uh, what we did very recently, uh, together again with Xinguai Li, we looked at data of another coup rate um, another, uh, at optimum doping, so it's also high temperature superconductor, um, and took the data and did the same thing that we have done for a terbium rhodium to silicon to namely subtracting a residual optical resistivity, just as you do in electrical resistivity. So there is a row zero that is subtracted before you look, I mean, the linear temperature behavior doesn't depend on that row zero. If one does that and puts the data on the same scaling plot as for a terbium rhodium to silicon to, miraculously, uh, the result is extremely similar. You get again, this exponent of one and the scaling appears to, to happen in a reasonable, reasonably wide uh, range of h bar omega over kVt. Also, the anchoring frequency dependence at the lowest temperature, here it's much higher, it's 75 Kelvin, because the energy scales are much, much larger in the coup rates, uh, is, is quite nicely seen at the lowest frequencies. So there's really a lot of similarity um, in the heavy fermion compounds uh, and, and the coup rates in terms of this dynamical nature of this charge localization, delocalization transition. And of course, I, I would be very happy to see more results on, on the whole jumps and see whether that's really true or not in the coup rates. So um, last thing uh, about this strange metal is uh, a very recent experiment that is conducted together with the group of Doug Natelson and that will be also reported there which again uses these MBE grown films and then patterns them into uh, sort of nanowires or mesowires, and then performs an experiment uh, that hasn't been used at all in this field uh, previously, uh, which is a shot noise experiments. And um, I will just flash the result here. It will be explained in more detail by uh, Doug in a, uh, one of the next talks. So the ver very interesting result is that the so-called FANO factor, um, which measures um, the type of carriers of charge or of, of, of current carriers in the system is very strongly suppressed 
which su suggests that quasi-particles are not well defined in this system. So this strange metal state where charges appear and disappear or localize and delocalize at the quantum critical, in the quantum critical state, makes a lot of sense that this does not have well-defined quasi-particles because we are destroying and uh, creating the quasi-particles all the time. So you will hear more about that shortly. Um, then I have, I think, five more minutes for um, emergent phases driven by strange metal behavior. And I will uh, come first to superconductivity. As you see here, and as I said already, of course, um, in many of these systems, superconductivity is the emergent phase, um, and it's not conventional, but it's unconventional superconductivity, um, most prominently, of course, in the high temperature superconductors, but also there in the heavy fermion compounds and the, in the iron nictides, and also in um, the moray, uh, hetero, some of the moray uh, heterostructures. So in this material, however, that seems to be nothing at all. And I will show you that that's the past and not the present. So first, why should um, such, fluctuate, such a fluctuating state lead to the creation of new phases? Uh, well, that's uh, quite intuitively explained here. So if you have this quantum critical fan, then what happens? The specific heat is strongly enhanced towards or the Sommerfeld coefficient, not the specific heat itself, the Sommerfeld coefficient or the ratio of um, entropy to temperature is strongly enhanced at the critical point. And that uh, is not comfortable for the system. It wants to re uh, release that entropy and thus use it uh, to form new phases. So that's uh, something that can be generically expected, but what type of phases can be there? That's an interesting question. So of course, in the cuprates, we know it's high temperature superconductivity. And in this material, we say, oh, what a surprise. There's nothing. Um, but in fact, there is something, but it is just there at very low temperatures. So it re required measurements uh, beyond uh, state of the art. So state of the art in, in the heavy fermion system is uh, dilution refrigerators. But that was not good enough for this material. And uh, we used, in fact, a nuclear demagnetization cryoset um, for these experiments, which is part of a European uh, user facility where you even from the US can apply for beam time with us. And uh, the results are shown here. So we have both field dependent curves and temperature de uh, iso field and isothermal curves, thus as function of temperature and of field. And we see, look at just the blue curve here, um, that there is clearly a transition to a superconducting state that's strictly zero. And this is just uh, the resistivity above the critical temperature. It has a bit of a complicated shape. And all these data together um, build this phase diagram here. So this is the quantum critical point. And we see that superconductivity extends to, and in fact, even slightly beyond the quantum critical point. And because the magnetic field, of course, has the tendency to suppress superconductivity against this trend of creating superconductivity from quantum criticality. It looks like it is almost suppressed at the quantum critical point, but you have to see the competing effects of both. Um, the fact is that this critical field of this uh, superconducting state is very large compared to both the orbital limiting and the Pauli limiting fields. And that supports strongly that the superconductivity is in fact created by the quantum critical point. And it tentatively uh, suggests that this might be um, a very interesting spin triplet superconducting state. Very last uh, point, um, other phases. And of course, interesting also for this workshop is, is there are there topological phases that could be formed by out of a strange metal state? And we have uh, a first experimental indication that this may be the case. Um, let me just flash uh, a state that um, we think can be created by these uh, strange metal, by this out of the strange metal state. That's a so-called wild condo semi-metal. I have no time to explain what, what this is. Um, but I just show you two key features of it. It has a linearly dispersing 
um, feature in its electronic structure, which is uh, due to a uh, while note. This while note has extremely flat, uh, so extremely slow velocity that what makes it visible in specific heat. And most notably, a so-called spontaneous Hall effect. That is a Hall effect without applying any magnetic field and the material is non-magnetic, um, which is the hallmark of this while condo semi-metal, it is related to the Berry curvature divergence, which exists at the wild point. So with that uh, in mind, you can understand the next uh, slide or the next, uh, the slide after this one here. So we have a material where we discovered quantum criticality that is like the one you have in condo destruction, uh, quantum critical points. It has again, this um, fractional exponent of um, the dynamical, uh, susceptibility as determined by neutron scattering um, and also the corresponding behavior in uh, magnetic susceptibility. So it is clearly a material that is quantum critical, in fact, without tuning. So there is no need to tune the system to this state. It's, it's, it's quantum critical um, as is. And um, if we apply a small amount of pressure we indeed observe this key signature of a wild condo semi-metal, uh, which is the spontaneous Hall effect. And the, the points you see here are the temperatures below which we see this effect. So that's the first indication that perhaps this phase is created by the quantum critical fluctuations of a strange metal. Okay, let me put up this pre uh, concluding slide. Strange metals are exciting. Uh, and can drive new phases, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Silke, wonderful talk. Uh, we have time for a few questions. Yes, Andrew. I, I had a question about the um, spin triplet superconductivity conclusion. So I imagine these uh, materials are pretty strongly spin orbit coupled. Um, in which case, I, I don't know, can you really conclude from power limit violations that you have spin triplet connectivity? Uh, you can certainly not conclude it from there, at least not firmly. Um, but luckily, we have some theoretical insight um, that suggests that it is possible, at least in the condo destruction quantum critical point. And that is um, this work here by uh, Jet Pixley and Shim Yao and co workers, um, which shows that. Um, well, in fact, it is it, it is um, showing that spin singlet pairing can come out of a condo destruction um, quantum critical point model. But if you include Ising uh, if you treat the Ising anisotropic case, which is reflecting the presence of the magnetic field, because it's magnetic field induced quantum critical point, then um, in fact the spin triplet pairing. Um, susceptibility is of the same order as the spin singlet one. So, so that says that it is possible, right? And then together with the evidence that the field is very large, that, that, that's what we have. We don't have anything else so far. Okay, thanks. Other questions? I'll jump in with one of my five questions. Um, so the, the scaling that you showed in the terahertz work, um, is there a low frequency, low energy cutoff in that that you expect? I bring that up because we have a much lower spectroscopy we could do. Which you know that that is really um, our dream for a next uh, big experiment. So it's clear that um, in the coup rates you can already see something, some some. Um, non-trivial fitting function. There's sort of some curvature in here from which maybe you could extract more information. In ytterbium rhodium to silicon two, we are just at the limit where, so, so we, we never reach the limit where um, H bar omega is much smaller than KBT. So here so really our, we need the microwave experiment to-, to our, our, our upper limit in H bar omega is one Kelvin. So it- yeah. Would nicely. Uh, I know it, it. It exactly matches, and we are definitely. Um, yeah. So, so this will also require the MBE film. So, so. Um, so yes. in in that case, you can't use ours. You'd have to go to Mark Scheffler at Stuttgart. 
yeah, we are already MB talking film. talking with yeah. him since long. But the yeah. MBE films are not there since very long, at least not in the sufficient quality. Yes. All right. Uh, thanks again. Beautiful talk. Okay. We'll move Thank you. On to our, our next speaker. So 